Father. Oh, thank you for your healing power working in those that are needing healing right now and restoration in every area. We continue to decrease so you would increase within us. Oh, we thank you, Father. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. holding up. Amen. All right, find you somebody that you don't know. Well, you already know everybody. 
turn and give them some virtual hugs. Rudy, but uh, virtual hugs to everybody. Turn, uh, Janine, uh, I guess, Jada, you know, you're kind of on your own over there, you know. Uh, well, you know, you're supposed to spread out, so I guess you're kind of o obeying that, I guess. So you can be seated and get in your Bibles, if you would, or your iPads or, or whatever. I'll tell you what, I, I was so blessed the other night. Uh, we didn't get to go to the pastor's conference this year. It was last week, but we were watching it on television. And I, I struggle all the time about, I like my iPad, and I like to use it, but I have my Bible, and I have my notebook, I have everything, but I use my iPad, and I was struggling, well, maybe 2021, maybe I, I don't have to use it as much. Maybe I won't use that. And I turned to, we went into the, it, the site that Barry had sent us, and we went out there to watch Brother Copen doing the last night of the minister's conference, and he walks up there, and first thing he does is pull out his iPad. And he's preaching, and then he's got everybody waiting for a minute, and he's, and he's doing all this. And I went, all right, I'll use mine. I, 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 he gave me that joy. So whatever you got, iPad, Bible, whatever it is, turn to Ecclesiastes the 11. Ecclesiastes 11. There's a song that goes about this, but different translations say different things. But look at Ecclesiastes 11. If you, if you look at the very first verse, let's read a few verses so you'll get the gist of that. And it actually talks about the value of diligence. But look what it says. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Now, if you look at that, most of us know that means that waves come in and go out, that if you cast your bread on a wave, it goes in, but it will come back to you. So if you start casting on every wave, it'll come back. But then he says, and you might just ought to do that seven or eight and minister to them because you don't know what may come evil on the earth. And in the day and hour that you and I are living in, you may not realize it, but your blessings that you have going on are because of the seeds you've been sowing. And the things happening, and someone said, what blessings? Well, it could be you affected a life, you ministered to somebody, you won them to Jesus, you did the... De Everything counts in God's kingdom. But then it goes on, if the clouds are full of rain, and then I thought about today, the clouds were full of wind, but I didn't feel any rain. But some people got snow. But look what it goes on to say. The clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth, and if a tree falls to the... Uh, to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not, as you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in, in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Then listen to this. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will prosper or be good. So we sow our seed, it comes back. Remember the song, keep on casting your bread upon the water, and it'll come back to you many days? That's what it's actually saying. So you give and expect it to come back, though, but if it's windy, you don't withhold because it's windy. Keep sowing. And then if it's what, nighttime or cloudy, you don't stop reaping, you reap. So all the wind does is remind me of not only that it's windy and it's ugly out, but that we keep reaping and sowing, sowing and reaping. We keep doing the things that are there. So get your offering in your hand. See it as seed. Seed. And if you want a fun study sometime, go into the Word and study when rain and wind and, and seed are combined together. Remember Isaiah 55? So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It's like the rain and the snow that comes down, waters the earth, produces it, and then goes back up. So everything uh, having to do with the weather is something that just reminds us that it's a glorious time to sow, a time to give into the kingdom. So put your offering in your hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we sow our seed tonight, we sow it in faith. We realize that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So we came to church in faith. We're here worshiping in faith. And now we're sowing our seed in faith. And when by faith, we'll receive your word. But Father, as we sow this seed, we thank you for the harvest. We thank you that it'll come back on many ways. And we'll even sow over and above in case of something that's out there trying to hinder in the earth. So we thank you for it. We sow it in faith. And you receive it, Father, as our gift. And our love offering to you in Jesus' precious name. And everyone agrees?
Amen. Ushers, minister to the people, Brother David. Thank you.
Thank you, baby girl. Glory. Now, they may not be a lot of you, but you can still be loud. So give him a good hand clap and a good shout. Glory. Come on, Steve. I need to hear that. Yo. Amen. You can be seated. Glory to God. Y'all, I want to commend you coming out on a, a, a night like this. I mean, you guys must want some word. Well, that's my faith anyway. I'm believing you do. Not, but but I, I, get, I got tickled. We were talking to Shell's dad, Frank, and, and I, he's watching. But we were talking today, and I, I get tickled because people leave Bakersfield to go to the coast to get away from the weather. And if they went to the coast this time, today, have they got a surprise? Because I think he said right, it was on the church of the Cayucas, right up above Morro Bay and all that, got six inches of rain today. The wind in Morro Bay was 70 miles an hour. So everybody that made that trip should have been in church tonight instead of over there. It's drier and less windy here. Amen. Look a person to your left again and say, you are the most humble person I know. Look at them and say it to it. Now, say it to the other person on the other side. You are the most humble person I know. Now, I saw some of you didn't say it. You didn't say it. I realize J9, that sometimes there's not a lot around to say it too, so, you know, but uh, you should say that about yourself. And different ones, someone said, well, what if I'm not? Well, then say it until you are. So those of you that are watching, which, what you pointing at? Oh, you got, hey, we got Kevin on the camera back there. All right. All right. You know, I was, we got the different people, you know, I like that. And again, thank Derek on the bass and singing. I mean, his voice is a, a tremendous voice, but I didn't know he, is it five instruments he plays? So, certainly. Is, how many of you here are like me, you don't play any instrument? Let me see, okay. Don't you just love it when somebody's that talented? You notice I didn't say jealous or anything like that, but anyway, well, that'd be good. So, I appreciate him and and ministering as people are not here and they're soaring up and and of course he's a part of the team now and so you don't come up here and minister that we don't keep you someone said that's why i don't volunteer i'm afraid you'll keep me there you need to volunteer so the lord can use you and be obedient open your bibles if you would and i want us to get into second timothy 3 again i started it on sunday and i want to continue with it and talk about it we're talking about the pursuit of humility if there's anything that you could say about what we see going on in the world around us right now, it is the statement that people are arrogant, haughty, and proud. They're high-minded. You just don't see a lot of humility. But humility and humiliation are two different things. They're not the same thing. Humiliation is what somebody might do to you, but humility is what you're supposed to do to yourself. Humble yourself. And so nobody else can humble you. They can humiliate or put you down or insult you or, or do different things. But to humble yourself, you're supposed to do it. So that's the opposite of proud. Look at 2 Timothy 3, and then we'll pray and get into this. Look at the second verse. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud. The word proud there, now these are in time uh, uh, signs and wonders to show us that it's the last days, it's perilous days, days, and these are all designed to weaken you and I and to sap our strength away is what the word perilous means. And in this day and hour, you can't hardly turn a TV on, pick up a print, do any much of anything other than pray and get into uh, get the word. Other than that, everything seems to almost sap energy from you instead of supplying it to you. And church is supposed to supply energy to you. So we're not talking about proud or pride. We're talking about humility, which is the opposite of it. So let's pray. You pray for me, I'll pray for you, and let's believe God together. Father, we thank you that as we approach your word, we thank you for those that are watching online, those that, that weren't able to make it here, or those that are, or can't make it here, Father, that are watching, 
minister to them, allow them to uh, sense and to hear and to receive that anointing and that word. And Father, hear, let the ears of the people be anointed to hear the effort they've given to sow seed into us, this church, and to be here, Father. Return that. Allow it to be supernatural in a return to them. And I thank you that as they came and as they go, they're divinely protected. I bind every germ and virus and bacteria. It'll have no place in their life. It'll come not, it'll not come near them. They are healed and whole while they're here, when they're gone, away from here. And Father, you'll strengthen them with might and your glorious power. Now open the eyes of their understanding to see and hear and to be changed by your word. Anoint these lips to pro proclaim the word as you direct it in every area. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Now, it says here pride is a symbol. Now, I was looking up examples of pride and humility, some situations and, and illustrations, and I came across this and and this is a true story, but I want to read you this because it has a lot to do with pride and humility. But Ronald Reagan told the following story. He said, I once addressed a very large, distinguished audience in Mexico City. And I sat down to rather scattered and unenthusiastic applause. And I was somewhat embarrassed. Even more so when the next man who spoke a representative of the Mexican gover government speaking in Spanish, which I do not understand, was being interrupted virtually every other line with the most enthusiastic kind of applause. To hide my embarrassment, I started clapping before everyone else and longer than anyone else until our ambassador leaned over to me and said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. He's interpreting your speech. So sometimes we get embarrassed because of a lack of knowledge, but for no reason. But also sometimes we should just be still and let everything else take care of itself. Now with that in mind, and this scripture here, it says here, men will be proud. The word proud there means haughty. It means high-minded. Uh, it means literally let me get mine back up here. I was teasing about Brother Copeland. Haughty, arrogant, to inflate oneself above others or high-minded. Now turn to 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, just back a few pages. In the 17th verse, and for time, I'm not going to keep you long tonight. But all of that is relative because what's long and, and whose definition. So anyway, but 1 Timothy 6, 17, the Amplified says this. As for the rich in this world... Charge them not to be proud and arrogant and contemptuous of others, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now notice, verse 17 does not command. It didn't say command the rich, charge the rich in this earth to give everything away to the poor so that they will serve me and be humble. It doesn't say that at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It says here they shouldn't trust in their riches nor be high-minded or haughty about their riches, but it didn't say that they were not supposed to have them to be humble. I find in the Bible he wants you to be successful. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be blessed. But he doesn't want you to trust in the riches. He wants you to trust him. He doesn't want you to get high-minded because of it. He wants you to be humble. So it's not saying here that you can't be blessed. It said don't be high-minded, haughty. The whole subject is about pride. It's about be, not being prideful. So again, pride means to be high-minded. It's to have a high and lofty estimation of oneself or oneself's ability a high and lofty opinion of your abilities and yourself. Now, humility is the opposite, and I covered this on Sunday. Humility is to be lowly in heart. Now, I want to make a statement. I want to say humility is not all the trials, tribulations, and the trouble you're going through. Humility is not being, uh, well, I'm sick, or I don't feel good, or I'm broke. or I, That's not humility. That's being sick and broke. What's the old song? Sick, sad, and sorry. That's not being humble because that's things that are happening to you. 
to be humble is what you do in your own self, what you do to yourself. So you do not get humbled by circumstances. You can get humiliated and embarrassed, but humbling is something you have to do in your heart, not what others are doing to you. It actually means lowly, mildness, and gentleness. Now, I brought up on Sunday, and I'm not going to go into it again. Everybody needs to be thinking about pride, and like we saw in the earlier session, about uh, selflessness or, or not being selfish because selfishness and pride stem from the devil himself. He is the author of it. That's what caused him to get cast down. And we went into that. And then I gave you on Sunday four realities about you and I. And it got no applause. It got no uh, uh, yeah, oh, oh. It, it didn't even get oh me's from those that it should have gotten oh me or oh my from. Truman Dillingham used to come and he'd say, ouch, fire. Ouch, fire, and, uh, indicating that hurt, and it's on fire. But four realities I gave you about us, and I want to get into the scriptures. You can go back and watch it. And one was without Christ, we are nothing. Two, without Christ, we know nothing. Three, without Christ, we have nothing. And four, without Christ, we can do nothing. So it didn't take me long to figure out without Christ, I really just have no reason to be proudful. I have no reason to be haughty and high-minded, but the good thing and the glorious thing is we are not without Christ. So in Christ, we are, have, can, and do the things that he's promised us. So we are not. But one of the worst effects, one of the, the results of pride, have you ever noticed the person that's really, really in pride will fight you for the, over the fact they're not in pride? Have you ever noticed that? I have. I know some proudful people that if you tried to tell them your problem is if pride, if you'd humble yourself, it'd be all that. Oh, they'll fight you and get upset with you, storm out the door. I'm never coming back to that guy. He doesn't even know what he's talking He called me prideful. I am humble and I'm proud of it. <laughs> and they, you know what I'm talking about. But, the person that's prideful has their mind and their understanding numbed. So turn to Daniel 5.20. I brought that out on Sunday, and, and I got some billy bits for you tonight because I, I haven't given you a lot. I like the, my little one-liner billy bits, and someone say, well, you only like it because it's a billy bit. Well, okay. It can be your bit. Put your name in the front of it. One of the worst effects of pride is it hardens your mind, your understanding. When you're proudful, it's not that people can't talk to you. You just don't understand because you've become numb. Now watch this. you become numb to anything but yourself. Now you want to hear yourself, but you don't want to hear anybody else. It's one of the symptoms. But look at Daniel 5.20. It says, but when his heart was lifted up, that's talking about pride, and his mind hardened in pride. His mind hardened. The actual rendering there in the Hebrew, if you study it out in the other translation, is he became dull of mind. He became numb, hardened, calloused in his mind. So look at it again. His, his heart was lifted up. His mind hardened in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. It actually renders they took his glorious kingdom from him. Because you remember we read it on Sunday, pride goeth before destruction and the Holy Spirit before a fall. So if they're in that, they are going to have what's there removed. But in this right here, uh, it says because of pride, his mind was hardened. Because of pride, his mind and understanding was numbed another translation it was numb have you ever had uh, your tooth fixed and you're numb and you can't feel it right there how many of you realize your your face is still there it has a change you just can't feel it well that's what pride does to your understanding and your mind doesn't mean your mind's not there you just you're numb to it so i, I i'll make a little pun here and you, you'll get this so if you get into pride you actually become dumber i mean number same thing. So with that in mind, the more in pride you are, the number you are, the more in pride you are, 
the dumber you are. You see the amens? Oh. All right, let's, let's change this a little bit. All of you know, I'm not talking about you, but it's somebody you know. Amen? So now you can amen like you're receiving that for whoever you're going to talk to after you leave here. So turn to Psalm 138. We finished with this on Sunday. I'm going to pick up here and talk about this some more. Psalm 138, 6. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Now, in the King James, in the New King James, that just, you know, sounds like a, a, a statement. It's something, a fact. But you have to study to see what that actually is. Listen to the New Living Translation there. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Now, you know the scripture says they will never leave you or never forsake you. That's a true statement. But when you get into pride, I don't know about you, prideful people are hard to be around, and God's not any different than you and I. You get into pride, God said he knows you. He knows you from high, but from afar, distance. He keeps his distance. I don't know about you. I don't want to get in pride and God keep his distance. Most of every day of my life, I need God close not far away, uh, and I sure don't want it to be because of pride, but it says here literally because of the pride he does this, that he stays away. Now, with that in mind, now where I want to go with this is why does God despise, even hate pride? Why does he say proud is an end time sign that's designed to, snap, to sap your strength, and, and, and it's perilous time. Because pride is something God not only uh, uh, disdains, he hates. Turn to Proverbs 6. Let me show you something. Proverbs 6. God looks at pride. Now, I don't know of another way to say it. This is a Billy Rash version of my Bible, not the King James. God hates pride with a perfect hatred. Because if God does it, it's mature and perfect. But he hates it. So look at Proverbs 6, 16 and 17. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Look at what he says first. A proud look. Pride, a proud look is first on the list, not fifth or sixth, first. And it's not seventh, the seventh thing, it's first. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are to obey, but uh, abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, heads that shed innocent blood. Now, I want to read you verse 17 in the Amplified. Does anybody here have an Amplified Bible? Uh, can you get it on your phone or whatever? I want you to look at this because the Amplified Bible gives you probably the best working definition of pride I've ever seen in all my studies. So look at, listen to Proverbs 6, 17 in the Amplified. A proud look, the spirit that makes one overestimate himself and underestimate others. A lying tongue and heads that shed, hands that shed innocent blood. So pride in this Amplified Bible says this. It is a spirit that makes one overestimate himself and underestimate others. So there's a two-part there. We all know that pride literally makes you overestimate yourself that's the very definition of pride but this is it's a spirit that makes you overestimate yourself and underestimate someone else so if you're underestimating someone else you're actually being arrogant haughty and high-minded because to you to underestimate them you're implying that you know they can't do something. You know something they don't know. You underestimate them. 
So pride has two areas to it. You overestimating yourself. We know that's a boastful, proudful person. But when you underestimate someone else, that's also an element of pride. And people get guilty of that all the time. All the time. And if I ask for a show of hands, I'm not going to. You and I know people that in the past we've thought that they would not be able to do something. And oh my goodness, to our amazement, they did it even better than we could have thought they would have done it. So we evidently had some pride that we underestimated them, which was overestimating ourselves. And then they surprised us. Anybody have anybody that surprised you before? Or am I just preaching to me? To a spirit that makes one overestimate himself and underestimate others. So here's the issue. Let me give you the issue of that spirit. Here's the spirit. Me, myself, and I. There's the spirit. Remember Satan and Isaiah? I will exalt myself. I, the five eyes of pride. It's the, the whole central issue of pride is me, myself, and I. Nobody could do it like I could do it. Nobody knows what I know about it, even though you're not only not an expert about it, you've underestimated everybody else, but you should have underestimated yourself because they know more about it than you do. And that's seen all around uh, us all the time. Notice the whole issue, me, myself, and I. Now turn to James 4, 6. We're going to look at quite a few scriptures and with the help of the Holy Spirit finish this particular teaching tonight so that you can humble yourself for Sunday's service. But look at James 4, 6. But he, talking about God, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, how many of you realize everybody, proudful or not, has grace available to them? This is not saying that God's not gracious. But have you noticed it's a whole lot easier to be gracious to people that are humble than to be gracious to the people that are proudful. And so the issue here is not that God, but this says God resists the proud. So now we know a proud look he hates, but pride he resists. And a lot of people that are prideful don't understand what's going on. Well, nobody gets me. They don't understand me. That's just showing them they, don't, they have no clue uh, who I am or what I'm doing or whatever thing like that. What they really don't understand is it's not that people are ignoring them. It's God resists them. So there's a difference in God seeing me from afar, but it says he resists me. So God resists the proud, gives grace to them. So let me give you, and we're not going to go in detail on all of these, but let me give them to you. I wouldn't be fair to teach about uh, the pursuit of humility and, and us fighting against a proud look or being proudful without giving you some indicators of pride. Now here's the favor I need. As I read these five indicators of pride to you, don't go, mm, because you gave yourself away. And don't put your head down and look at the ground. Look up here, smile at me like, he's not talking about me. Everybody smile at me. Try that. Let me see your smile. Some of you not. Oh, you, you got it, don't you, girl? Okay. Darlene's got it. She always smiles at me. Even if she knows that what I'm saying is for just me and her. We always know that. But here's number one indicator of pride. Are you always speaking about yourself? Are you always talking about yourself? Number two, are you unhappy unless you are seen and noticed? Do you get upset if somebody didn't notice you? Number three, are you unhappy unless you're the center of intention? Number four, are you unhappy being ignored? Now, don't misunderstand. I don't like people being unfriendly. 
There's a difference in that. I, I run into people all the time. I love to go to see people that I know I love. I hadn't done anything wrong, but they know that they might have said or done some things wrong in it, and I know that, but I'm not going to throw anything up in anybody's face. I, my commission is to love people and forgive people and be a lover. You run into them, you'll see them, and, and not only do they not go down the aisle where they see you, they turn and go the other way. The other way. Well, that doesn't get me upset I was ignored. I wasn't unhappy about that. But I'm talking about some people get upset. Uh, let me tell you a little story. I shouldn't do this. There was a couple. They didn't like me. They didn't like my staff. They didn't like Shell. They didn't like Pastor Renee. Can you imagine that? I can't even comprehend that. And they, they left ugly. They didn't just leave. They left ugly. And they were in... Sam's Club, and I was walking, and I, I ran into them. They turned and walked and went the other way. I couldn't pass it up. So I turned and went around and went around there and came facing back up to him again. I said, hey, how y'all doing? Called his name. He said, hey, hey, uh, ha, 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 you know. And as they went on by, she didn't speak. As he went on by, I heard her. You talk to him. I can't believe you talk. And I, then that made me feel even better. <laughs> now, I know that was ugly. I repented. I repent to you for even telling you that story. But you know you won't do it. So. But are you unhappy being ignored is number four. But number five, does it really bother you when people don't acknowledge you? These are five indicators of pride. And you may say, well, I don't have any of those. Well, there may be some other indicators that are besides this, but you may say, I have all of those. Let me say them again. Are you always speaking and talking about yourself? Your most favorite subject is you, and you don't want to talk about anything else. Number two, are you unhappy unless you're seen and noticed? We go to the pastor's conference, and we laugh about it. We get tickled about it. And if any of you have been to the, to the convention center, so Pastor Renee has been with us and all like that, we know people, and they know us. But we go in there, and if, if they say, come on up here, we have a, a seat safe for you, I'm excited. I'm blessed. If they didn't, I'm not offended. I'll, I'll sit in the back. I just, I'm there for the word. I'm there to be built up. But they'll do it. And, but we see people that will walk up while the speaker's singing, looking like they're supposed to have a seat. And I'm sitting there, I, you know, I'm wanting to throw them to the back. I know that's not nice, but sit down. Or they'll wait till everybody's seated. The thing's going, and then they make their entrance. <laughs> They'll find where, and everybody's, the speaker's going, everybody's looking there. And they sit down, and then, you know, and they're waving at everybody, and they'll turn to me and shell, and we'll go. <laughs> because we're listening to the word. How many of you realize pride will distract you if you let it? Not yours, other people. So are you unhappy unless you're seen and noticed? Are you unhappy unless you're the center of attention? Are you unhappy being ignored? And does it really bother you when people don't acknowledge yourself? Here's what I want to throw out here in putting all these together, that you should examine yourself always. Let me say it. You should always examine yourself of why you're talking to someone about yourself. See, I'm talking to you about me, but I'm making an example and a teaching example because that's pastoring or teaching. But I'm we should examine this. Why am I always talking to other people about me? Are you your favorite subject? You might be surprised to know you're probably you're the only person who you're the favorite subject. You ever notice that? Now, i got a billy bit for you. I want you to listen to this carefully. People will be more impressed with you when they find out things about you that you didn't tell them. Let me say it again. I'll say it over here. This group got it. Of course, there's 
just eight. Let me get over here. People will be more impressed with you when they find out things about you that you didn't tell them. In fact, let me give you my second Billy bit now instead of a little bit later. Never try to impress someone. Just be impressive. Never try to impress someone. Just be impressive. That'll take care of itself. Those are my two Billy bits. They're free. I'm not going to take another offering up. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Go through my sword drill here right quick. Got to give you scripture on everything I'm saying to you because if not, it's just me giving you opinion and thoughts. It's not Bible. Look at Proverbs 27, 2. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. I don't think it could be any clearer than that. You don't need to talk about yourself to others. Let them find out about you besides you telling them. Now, I'm not talking about testimony. I'm not talking about I have our our outreaches and ministries uh, give us a report. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, bragging. Listen to, turn over to Proverbs 25. Go back a couple chapters. The 16th verse. Now, remember, this is in the Word. It's not me using the, some of these words. Proverbs 25, 16. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. Now, I know somebody say, he said the V word. He said vomit. Oh, no, okay, regurgitate. Now, who uses that? Anyway, spew is what the Revelation says. He'll spew you out of your mouth, which is the word vomit. So let me read it to you again. It's not good to eat too much honey, nor does it bring on... uh, It's not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glorious. 16th verse says, Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. What is he talking about? He eating honey? No, not just that. It's an example. Look at verse 27. It's not good to eat much honey. So here he's still carrying the same thought on. So to seek one's own glory is not glory. Now let me read that to you in the New Century Version. You'll get what he's saying. It's not good to eat too much honey, nor does it bring you honor to brag about yourself. So just like eating too much honey makes you vomit, bragging about, now watch this. This is almost a play on words. Bragging about yourself makes everybody else want to vomit. Amen? You know, I'm telling you the truth. I'm I'm just laying it out there. And thank God it doesn't relate to any of you. It's not good to eat too much honey, nor does it bring your honor to brag about yourself. If you eat too much honey, it makes you vomit. If you brag too much about yourself, why are you surprised people think you stink and don't want to be around you? Because you've been vomiting. I didn't write it. I'm just giving you the... Someone said, yeah, but you don't have to make it so graphic. I didn't. It, it's there. Look at it. Turn over to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in case you think this is just New Testament. I mean, Old Testament. I want to show you something Paul said to the church in Corinthians. Remember how arrogant they were. They uh, had to be corrected about the man's stepson or the man's son having an affair with his stepmother and had to be corrected. They were going on and, and not even doing anything. He corrected that, but then they wanted to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. They were killing him, and then Paul had to write to him again and say, okay, forgive him. He's wanting to repent. And so they had to be corrected. But look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 18. Look at what it says. 2 Corinthians 10, 18. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends the contemporary english version reads this way you may brag about yourself but the only approval that counts is the lord's approval listen to the message is great i like this commentary what you say about yourself means nothing in god's work it's what god says about you that makes the difference that's taking care of pride that so 
you may be wondering, why am I spending this much time on humility versus pride? Well, let me answer that. Go to Proverbs 13.10. Let me answer it with the word. Let me show you why I'm spending so much time on this. Instead of letting you get out of here and head to the house or to the restaurant or to the taco bar or whatever you want. Instead of Taco Tuesday, it's Taco Wednesday. Every day is Taco Day, what Pastor Renee says. Look at Proverbs 13 and 10. By pride comes nothing but strife. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Pride brings strife. Pride, if you have strife, then pride is in there stirring the pot. Some word, it's stirring the pot. Look at Proverbs 28, 25. The reason I'm hitting on this so much is almost all, if not all, strife can be dealt with, eliminated with humility. A little humility. Look at Proverbs 28, 25. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. So pride, a proud heart, stirs up strife. And where strife is, there's confusion, and every evil work is going on. So pride causes and stirs up strife, and strife is where confusion and every evil work gets its uh, strength from along with selfishness or selfish ambition so selfish ambition and pride stirs up strife and that's where it gets all of that that whole working in somebody if somebody's in strife with somebody somebody's in pride now I don't know which one and let me make a statement to you sometimes the worst thing you can do is interject yourself in between the strife of, say, two people. Let me just use two. Two people are in strife. To interject yourself in the middle of the strife can get you into the point to where you may be wrong about who's in strife or they may both be prideful, and now you are the enemy. If you don't believe that, ask law enforcement that goes out to domestic disputes. I've been on some of those ride-alongs. And I'm telling you, it was amazing to me. They were knocking each other out, beating each other, and knocking each other down. I'm talking about the woman knocking the man down in this case. And they were going at it, and it goes both ways. And the police officer steps into the middle, and now they gang up, and they're on him when he was trying to keep them from killing each other in the strife. But one of them was in pride, or both of them. So if two of them are in pride... You need to stay humble because the prideful one is not going to hear you because their heart is numb. And the one that's not proudful is going to want you to take the blows for them so they can get out the door. So, watch this. this here's what I'm saying. If you know strife and evil and every confusion work is going on, there's the thing you need to do. Stay away from it. Stay out of the strife. Oh no, God's anointed me to to God's anointed me to stop it. Okay. Number one characteristic of pride is just talking about yourself. God's anointed me. Well, if He's anointed you to get rid of strife and people that are fighting, listen, you see, Pastor Renee, I've got a list for you. I got a list of people I need you to go see. Now, if you're here and you get a visit, then you know you just told on yourself. Don't be. Now I'm just teasing. By pride comes nothing but strife, but the well advised is wisdom. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. Pride, proud heart stirs up strife. Where strife is, the, now turn to James four ten. Let me close this. The pursuit of humility. Look at James 4.10. Now watch this. It says, let others humble you in the sight of the Lord. No, it doesn't say that. Humble yourself 
in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Turn over to 1 Peter 5, 6. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So look at 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Notice here, you are to humble yourself. People don't do it. Others don't do it. If your job is to humble somebody you think in your mind, then you're arrogant, haughty, high-minded, and in pride. It is not your job to humble anyone. It is people, yours and my job, to humble ourselves. And then God will exalt us. But here's a statement. If you don't humble yourself and others can't humble you, what can happen? I don't know who asked that. Glad you did. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 12. Let me show you biblically the answer. Paul again dealing with the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12th chapter. We are to humble ourselves. But if you don't, as a believer, I got some good news. And in that good news is not so good news. Here's the good news. God loves you. And he cares. So look at 2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear lest, Paul's writing, when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions. Now remember, contention and strife is caused by pride. So look what he says. Jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. I don't know. I've yet to figure out what a tumult is. I mean, we don't talk. Uh, let's, let's, go, let's all go over to Jackery's house and tumult. I don't even know what that is. Or not. <laughs> don't be going. Anyway, I was just making an example. We don't use that word. Then look at what the first part of verse 21 says. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you. Now, don't take that out of context. God's just not walking around, looking around for ways to humble you. But if you get into pride and there's stint, strife, contentions, and all of these things going on around you, tumults, this says God will humble you. Now, I didn't write this, and I didn't make this up, and I didn't go anti-faith. In fact, I can tell you what, you can pretty well trust that. You get into pride and you not humble yourself, I guarantee you there is a humbling coming and it'll be God that does it. And usually he'll do it in the midst of all the strife and contentions. In other words, where you didn't want it to happen. See, we don't want it to happen. There was a story of a, and it's a true story, of a, a British lawmaker. And he went into a restroom in London and this publisher of a newspaper, a big publisher, went in there and happened to be in there at the same time. And it was very awkward. So the publisher said to the member of parliament, he said, I want to tell you I was wrong. Forgive me for the things I said to you in my paper. And the, the guy from parliament looked at him and he said, okay, I forgive you, but I wish you would have embarrassed me here in the restroom and apologized in your paper. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. So humble yourself. The spirit of pride is an overestimation of yourself and an underestimation of someone else. And I'm going to tell you what, there has been many times in pastoring and ministering and things that I have underestimated people that have ended up being some of the most fabulous, mean, anointed, used to God to people that I didn't think. And it taught me a, a very early lesson in ministry. You, you can't read the cover or read the, you can't know what the book says by the cover. You got to get inside of it and let that play out. But the spirit of humility is to humble yourself and not overestimate yourself. You aren't the most favorite subject at every conversation. 
if somebody ignores you and didn't see you, do you know the person that didn't see you or say anything or ignore you? That person may have just been trying to focus their belief in God to fight off some sickness and disease that's trying to overtake it, and they're focused on that, and it's not that they're ignoring you. It's just they're trying to stay focused. I've seen people come into church that I knew had need. The Holy Spirit would tell me, had, and, and people interrupted them, and people, uh, uh, inter, you know, not even caring that people are there with needs. That's pride. Because I know, I know this is going to shock some of us, but it's not all about us but it is all about people. It's all about people, but it's not all about us. It's about all of us. So the spirit of pride is to overestimate yourself and underestimate others. The spirit of humility is to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. Then the next verse says, casting your care over on the Lord. Do you know how you humble yourself? Cast your care over on the Lord. If you cast your care on the Lord, that's humility. That's why I started this by saying the highest form of humility is prayer. Because some people need to understand you can't do it. You need God to do it. And to ask God to do it is humility. It's humbling yourself. Amen? Did you get anything out of this? All right. I told you I was going to get you out close. I really did. That's close for me. But some of you won't even have to hurry to get home. The wind will take you home. Amen. Well, stand to your feet. Glory to God. Sunday, we get to pick it up. And, and I'm going to tell you what. I can't pass this up. I'm teasing you. I'm telling you this by teasing you. If you're really humble, I'll see you Sunday. That's not fair. I'm just teasing you. I'll see most of you here. If you're here on a Wednesday night, unless you're working, which some people have to work, unless you're, you'll be here. And some people I know have one car and somebody's using it to work and they can't get here but they watch online so i love those people i mean there are people watching online right now i love them and they're not ignoring us if you don't see people here don't make any assumptions just pray for them you follow what i'm saying well i wonder why they're not here what are they pray for them you don't even have to wonder someone said well i don't know what to pray pray in tongues the holy spirit knows how to pray when you know not how he takes the whole together with you.